Let's listen to what uh, John Kirby, National Security Council spokesman, said on Air Force One tonight. I think we have that ready to go. When he talks to Prime Minister Netanyahu and to the War Cabinet, um, he's going to be doing a few things. One, he's going to get a sense from the Israelis about the situation on the ground, uh, and more critically, their objectives, their plans, their intentions uh, in the days and weeks ahead. And he'll be asking some tough questions. He'll be asking them as a friend, as a true friend of Israel, but he'll be asking some questions of them. Uh, Rick Stengel, you've been in that situation uh, as an Undersecretary of State where you have to ask the tough questions uh, and ask them of a friend. Uh, what would be the tough questions that President Biden will be presenting tomorrow? I think John mentioned some of them. What's, what's the end game in Gaza? Uh, if you do uh, get rid of Hamas as the leader of Gaza, who replaces them? What are your plans for the West Bank? Uh, what are your plans for the nations that you had normalized relationships with who are now probably more estranged? I mean, there are lots and lots of questions. And, and as John Kirby said, if that's the questions that a friend, that an ironclad ally, as Tony Blinken said, can ask. Uh, very few presidential trips have been put together as fast as this one. Uh, you know, Bibi Netanyahu said, in effect, you know, please come to Israel, probably not expecting a very fast response from the <laughs> president on that, probably expecting, you know, maybe in a few weeks. Uh, president Biden sets up that trip as fast as possible. Basically, on the way to the airplane, uh, the president finds out the, 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 uh, the, the, the summit with the other leaders is canceled. That's off because of uh, this explosion at the hospital. First of all, he finds out about the explosion at the hospital. And no doubt is wondering how is this going to affect it. He finds out pretty soon how this is going to affect it. Uh, talk about this kind of trip. State Department organization, everyone organizing this, uh, national security officials organizing this trip. And as you minute by minute, the way it can change with this unfolding information. Yes. And as you know, Lawrence, President Biden expressed his grief and sadness about what happened at the hospital um, Obviously, that changes the calculus of the trip. I mean, one of the things that was special about this trip was the fact that he was going to go to Jordan and meet with King Abdullah, to meet with uh, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, uh, to meet with President Sisi of Egypt. I mean, part of what President Biden can do, and he's a great believer in personal diplomacy, is that he's hoping to quell some of the rage in the region, to speak with some moderation among Israeli, Israel's allies. And I think the other thing he wants to do, which, which John Kirby has said and which other people at the NSC have said, is he wants to talk to Bibi not only about his endgame, but about restraint, about being careful about civilian casualties. That's also something a friend can do. Well, and, and after this event, uh, that is an unavoidable discussion. It, it, it's one that, uh, a discussion that Israel has to be even more welcoming to after this event today. Yes, and, and again, one of the... And, and that isn't to say that, it, that Israel is to blame for this at all, but it, it is a matter of perception that they have to be very much concerned about. Yes, any loss of civilian life is tragic. Uh, no matter what Israel says about this, the Arab street will probably not believe it. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he is there to... See to talk to, to Netanyahu about how he sees the future, uh, about being more restrained. I mean, one of the unintended consequences is that if there is going to be a ground invasion, it's not going to happen while President Biden is there. That's a change. Yeah, so there's a minimum, uh, there's some level of delay in President Biden making this trip. It pushes off whatever the schedule might have been on any kind of ground invasion. Uh, we are so used to, after these high-tech wars that we've been seeing, uh, beginning uh, with, with the first pushback of Saddam Hussein by American forces when he invaded Kuwait. We're so accustomed to being able to see video of these smart missiles going right down into their target, exactly where they're going. We've seen some of that kind of video already uh, this week. Is it likely that if Israel is responsible for this, what happened at the hospital, that they would be in possession of actual video that shows one of their missiles going in there, uh, even if unintentionally. Yes, that's certainly possible. And again, the, uh, those videos always give the sense of and sometimes the illusion of accuracy that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. 
But, you know, we're also living in the realm of, and I've written a lot about this, the realm of disinformation and deep fakes that we've already seen so much disinformation on the web, on social mm -hmm. media platforms from all sides here so that, um, you know, we may never know the true answer. Uh, as we go forward, uh, the president has said he wants to have this meeting uh, in person, you know, that was canceled. Uh, so we may, we could see him possibly back in the region next week. It's just hard to say what his travel schedule is going to be. Yeah. I mean, he wants to both show the nature of the friendship and support that we have for Israel, but he wants to show world leadership. He wants to show leadership in Israel. Remember, a recent poll in Israel showed that two thirds of Israelis would replace Benjamin Netanyahu with anyone else. Half of Israel watched the speech that Biden gave the other day. He's there in some ways as part as a as a leadership figure for the people of Israel. They trust America. They trust him. And he will presumably see whoever succeeds Bibi Netanyahu to be at the prime minister of Israel. There are indications of more public support for Joe Biden in Israel than Netanyahu in Israel as of tonight. Absolutely. Uh, President Biden is the, is the much more popular leader in Israel than Bibi Netanyahu. Joining us now from Tel Aviv is New York Times columnist Roger Cohen. Roger, thank you very much for joining us again tonight. Uh, you joined us uh, last week uh, when we were uh, just less than a week into this. Uh, at the time, your uh, column, in your column in the New York Times, you said, a page has been turned, whatever the outcome of the war, that has just begun. It seems like a page is being turned every day now. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Yes, it does. Um, a tense and difficult situation just became even more tense and difficult as President Biden is about to arrive in Israel with the explosion at the Al Ali Hospital in Gaza and the loss of hundreds of lives and the Palestinians blaming Israel for it and Israel retorting that this is in fact the work of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, an organization designated as a terrorist group by both the United States and the European Union, saying a malfunctioning rocket uh, caused this. So the president is stepping into as fraught an environment as it's possible to imagine in an Israel still filled with grief and shock at the Hamas attack that killed 1,400 um, Israelis, and there are 200 who are held hostage in Gaza. Is, uh, with the passage of time uh, from October 7th to now, and with what's happened uh, in Gaza today at that hospital, will it make uh, the Israeli government and war cabinet more open to the Biden concerns about uh, risks to civilians in Gaza? That's hard to say, Lawrence. I think there is certainly awareness that for a democracy like Israel, the rules and laws of war matter. They matter, and everything possible should be done to avoid civilian deaths in Gaza, the deaths of Palestinian civilians who must be distinguished from Hamas. That, however, has proved extremely difficult up to now. The area is being bombarded. There are already uh, thousands of Palestinians dead, according to the Palestinian health authorities. So there will certainly be pressure from, I think, President Biden uh, urging Israel to be as prudent and careful as possible while recognizing that Israel cannot live alongside a terrorist organization whose charter calls for the end of the state of Israel and the slaughter of Jews and has just shown that it is very serious about that. I, I want to listen to something that uh, a senior Hamas official said on October 11th. Uh, let, let's listen to this. الإسرائيلي معروف عنه أنه بحب الحياة إحنا منضحي نعتبر أنه قتلنا شهداء 
فامن يعني اهم أمني عند اي واحد فلسطيني انه يستشهد في سبيل الله لا يدفع عن ارضه Uh, Roger, if you don't have the on-screen translation there, what he said is the Israelis are known to love life. We, on the other hand, sacrifice ourselves. We consider our dead to be martyrs. The thing any Palestinian desires the most is to be martyred for the sake of Allah defending his land. And so that is a senior Hamas official, and that is his attitude uh, toward both uh, Israeli life and Palestinian life. Well, personally, Lawrence, I think all life is sacred and that we must value human life. Um, uh, that is uh, a core belief of mine, and I, I believe there are millions of Palestinians who also value life, as certainly uh, Israelis do. I think one of the tragedies of this situation over the past decades is that the option of a victimhood uh, has been chosen uh, in many instances, I think. There have been opportunities uh, for the Palestinian people and for Israel to reach a two-state outcome, allowing both peoples to live in dignity, in peace, uh, beside each other, and in security. Those opportunities have been missed. And victimhood leads nowhere. It leads nowhere in the end. There is nothing. The past is past. The question is, do you want to put food on the table of your children? Do you want to move forward? And after the terrible things that have happened uh, over the last 10 days, I think both Israel uh, and Palestinians must ask themselves at some point, isn't it time to bring this terrible conflict to an end and to move forward in dignity as human beings, all of the people of the Holy Land? Thank you very much for joining us tonight, Congressman Clyburn. Uh, uh, you know, I know you've seen everything in the House, and now you've seen a little more in the House. What happens next? Well, thank you very much for having me. What happens next is that we meet again at 11 o'clock in the morning. There will be a quorum call, and after which we'll have another vote on trying to elect a speaker. Uh, I would hope. Uh, that after all of this time, uh, that the leadership of the Republican Party uh, will sit down in earnest uh, with Leader Jeffries, who has been extending an offer time and time again to reach a bipartisan path forward so that the people of this country can have their business attended to. Right now, we cannot get to the attendance of their business, simply because the Republicans seem to be putting their politics over the people's interest. And we would like to see us working together as Democrats and Republicans, trying to get the security of this country assured and the safety of, Mer of the American people uh, attended to. And I would hope uh, that will start tomorrow. What would that meeting be like? What, what would uh, Congressman Jeffries be seeking in that kind of meeting? Well, as you know, we made some agreements uh, back in May uh, on what we should do to fund the government going forward. Uh, and the former speaker uh, allowed uh, his uh, conference to walk away from that agreement. The, how the Senate... Democrats and Republicans adhered to the agreement and have been marking up to those numbers. Not so in the House. We saw the former Speaker say he would not bring about any kind of an impeachment inquiry uh, of President Biden without a vote. Yet, he ordered uh, that this uh, procedure uh, begin and did not have a vote. And so we want to see this kind of stuff put aside. Stop these investigations, especially when you have the guy who you have given the most of your votes to, to be speaker, is the one who's been running the investigations and been inviting his own witnesses to come. And his own witnesses have been saying there's nothing here uh, that borders on anything akin uh, to impeachment. So let's get this foolishness out of the way. Let's get someone who believes in democracy, 
someone who believes in this country moving forward in search of perfection, uh, someone who believes that we should put the people of this country over the politics that we practice. And I don't think that is Jordan. And you just heard, heard a litany of things uh, that underscore uh, mm -hmm. that. So in that uh, approach, one of these uh, people today who got single digit votes, uh, someone like uh, Tom Cole, for example, who got one vote, uh, who there was a day, you know, in the pre-Trump era of the House of Representatives, uh, Tom Cole was one of the reasonable Republicans who you could easily envision one day be becoming a speaker. Uh, so a candidate like that down at the bottom of the list could conceivably get all the Democratic votes for speaker and pick up another uh, handful from the Republicans and become speaker if that candidate pledged to stick to the deal that Republicans made with President Biden on the debt ceiling and financing the government after that, uh, along with some of these other issues you've raised. Is that what, we're, what you're suggesting? Well, I would suggest it would be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know if you get uh, 212 Democrats uh, and only uh, uh, six or so uh, Republicans. That's not the bipartisanship that I'm looking for. I would hope that a critical mass of Republicans and Democrats uh, can come together, as we did uh, when we passed McCarthy's bill to keep the government open. We had a critical mass, over 300 votes. In fact, more Democrats voted for it than, than Republicans, but it was a critical mass on both sides. And so you can rule a uh, House, run things, uh, if you have that kind of a vote with Democrats and Republicans, not just barely getting by at 218, but get 320, 350 votes with a critical mass of both parties uh, voting for the person. If Jim Jordan does somehow manage uh, to get to the magic number that gives him the speakership after, I don't know, 15 ballots or something like Kevin McCarthy, <laughs> uh, do you think his speakership would last as long as Kevin McCarthy's did? I don't think so. Uh, but I think, because I think the American people will weigh in on this. Here's a guy who's been here for 16 years, never passed a single bill. What did he come here for? I think we heard it uh, from the former speaker uh, when he said he is a legislative terrorist. He's all about tearing things down, not building things up. Uh, I learned as a child, my dad just said to me all the time, son, anybody can tear things down. It takes some thought and it takes some intelligence to build things up. And so we want to have thoughtful people, people who want to use their intellect to build things for the American people, not tear down everything uh, that they may see uh, on the floor of the House, but bringing people together, building consensus, finding common ground, and moving forward on behalf of the American people, making this country's greatness accessible and affordable for all of its citizens. Carson Clyburn, before you go, I want to ask you about your friend Joe Biden, who you endorsed for president at a crucial time in the campaign. He is uh, somewhere over the Atlantic now uh, on his way uh, to Israel. He is uh, the president of the United States who has been to Israel more than any previous president of the United States, having gone several times during his decades as a senator. Uh, during his time as vice president of the United States, uh, now his uh, second trip as, as president of the United States to Israel. No president has ever had more experience in the country of Israel. What are you hoping that he can achieve at what has now become an even more difficult time uh, in the region than it was yesterday? It is very much more difficult today than yesterday. And I don't, can't think of a single person in these United States better equipped to address these issues. He has demonstrated that time and time again. And I heard uh, earlier this afternoon uh, that the uh, polling uh, in Israel uh, show that he is very popular uh, with the uh, people of Israel, uh, much more popular uh, than their own prime minister. So they believe in him. So he's gone over there 
He is going to sit down uh, with the leadership and hopefully find some common ground for us to get this issue behind us. As you know, I grew up in the Postage. Uh, I've been studying uh, this issue, uh, the disagreements uh, in the Middle East. It's been going on uh, for a couple of thousand years. Uh, and we have got to work hard uh, to do what is necessary uh, to bring people together so they can co uh, coexist uh, in that part of the country. I can't think of anybody better equipped at this particular juncture to do that than Joe Biden.